Is it legal to put the brakes on an online stock frenzy? Marketplace Morning Report is supported by C3.ai. C3.ai software enables organizations to use artificial intelligence at enterprise scale, solving previously unsolvable business problems. Learn more at C3.ai. And by Indeed, committed to delivering quality candidates so businesses can focus on interviewing people with the skills they need. Learn more at Indeed.com slash credit. I'm David Brancaccio. After shares of the video game retailer GameStop closed down 44% yesterday, they're up 75% in pre-market trading now. Marketplace's Nova Safo is continuing to follow one of our big market stories of the week. Where are we now? Well, we're heading back to where we were before yesterday, sort of, David. Uh, yesterday, depending on which online platform they were using, individual traders could sell or hold, but not buy GameStop, AMC, and some of the other stocks that have been in uh, individual traders' crosshairs. Today, Robinhood said it will once again allow limited purchases, and another online brokerage, Interactive Brokers, says it'll lift restrictions as well. Now, some see restrictions as prudent. They have infuriated others. What's the logic for them? Well, the brokerages say they had to do it because clearing a trade for a customer means brokerages putting up a bunch of money in the short term, and it was basically getting too expensive. Robinhood reportedly even borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars tapping into its lines of credit. But the result of the restrictions was that some people could freely trade, others couldn't. And we spoke about the legal implications of that with Jill Fish. She's a securities law professor at the University of Pennsylvania. It's a little bit problematic to think about banning customers from some brokerage firms from trading the stock while others are free to do so. It's much more common if there's a uh, stock that's mispriced or a stock that's unduly volatile for the exchanges to take action so that all investors are treated equally. And so to get at those concerns, Democrats in the House and Senate are planning hearings, David. All right, Nova, thank you. The Dow future now down 249 points, 8 tenths percent. The Nasdaq future down more than 1 percent. And think about this, in less than 15 years, every car, SUV, and pickup made by General Motors will put out no, zero emissions and run on something other than carbon dioxide producing fossil fuel. The plan announced by GM CEO Mary Barra yesterday is a big lift. Marketplace's Mitchell Hartman reports. GM has already invested heavily to develop electric vehicles and convert assembly lines. Still, getting to a zero-emission all-electric fleet in just 14 years will be like navigating one of those drive-test obstacle courses. GM is a profitable company right now, but as they transition, it's going to present a lot of profitability issues. Garrett Nelson at CFRA Research says GM's track record isn't great. The company has discontinued a number of models, the Chevy Volt, the Cadillac CT6, because they haven't sold particularly well. But he says Tesla's breakout success selling electric vehicles is driving GM to double down. Kristen Gicek at the Center for Automotive Research says GM's got company. All of the automakers are talking about cleaning their operations and unveiling a whole range of electric and electrified models. She says they have to, to meet climate change goals from governments worldwide. I'm Mitchell Hartman for Marketplace. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by UKG. Two HR technology companies have joined forces to become UKG Ultimate Kronos Group, offering HR solutions to connect the modern workforce. Learn more at UKG.com. Our purpose is people. And by Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where research on how cancer cells get oxygen led to development of kidney cancer drugs and more. DanaFarber.org slash everywhere. Fast Track, our ongoing coverage of the logistics of COVID vaccine distribution, arguably the biggest logistical operation in human history. Today, let's check in with a nurse coordinating distribution for Ballot Health, a hospital and clinic group. Jamie Swift is Chief Infection Prevention Officer at Ballot, serving the Appalachian region of Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You have people 75 and older coming in now for their second booster shot. Tell me about a day in your life as you work to make that happen. Yeah, so it really has been a team effort up here. We have currently what we're calling community vaccination clinics. We have those set up not within our hospitals that are in 
um, different buildings and things that we have throughout the, the region. So really just getting people in that appointment, getting them through their second dose. So we know who came in for their first shot. They get an appointment to come in for their second shot. So the day and time they need to come back to that same location. And then we know if we've had people that haven't shown up and we will follow up with those individuals. It is interesting though, you got to do this across state lines. It does add some complexity. Yeah, it is very different. So they're even in different phases. So Virginia is 65 and up. Tennessee is still 75 and up. Some are doing teachers, some are not. So it really is very different messaging. Even though we're one organization, our sites are having to operate very differently as we follow the lead of the state health departments. So we over here don't have enough vaccine here in parts of the east. Our region is not alone in this. You have enough there? We do not. The demand far outweighs the supply at this point. So, you know, at this point, we're honestly having to stand down our community vaccination clinics until we get more vaccines. So we're finishing the second doses. Those come automatically. We're finishing those second. We just don't have any more first doses to offer in those clinics. So we are having to to pull back on the community vaccination clinics in Tennessee. In Virginia, we're still able to keep those two sites open. All right. What about the trained people you need to pull all this off? Because this is going to be going on for a while. It is. When we opened these community vaccination clinics, we actually reached out to several of our retired nurses. We've hired them back to just come in, work a few hours each day and give vaccines. And that's been a great partnership with with some of those nurses who were more than willing to help, but had retired and moved on and not really working at the bedside anymore. Jamie Swift, RN, is Chief Infection Prevention Officer at Ballad Health in the Appalachian region where Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia come together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, we also hear from an intensive care nurse in California dealing with the multiple stresses of losing family and losing patients during the pandemic. Marketplace.org, if you missed that on the air. I'm David Brancaccio with our morning report. We're from APM, American Public Media.